Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Now, I'm not sure if any of you knew that by coming to Leeds, you would have probably died after listening to one or two of my speeches. But life is full of surprises, and I don't see why anybody should have warned you. But I have good news for you, because yes, you may have suffered because of uh, my own uh, speech writing, but the fact of being here in Leeds all together and talking about the incredibly uh, negative experience actually added a couple of years to your lifespan. Now, what do I mean by this? Do you have to talk with me every single year to actually add one or two years onto um, your um, uh, life? No, but let's take it one step at a time and I'll try and explain what exactly I mean by that. Now, as you can see, there are more women than men in this room, which means that statistically speaking, um, all of you will outlive Andrea and myself by a couple of years. Indeed, in the whole world, women live an average of six to eight years longer than men do. Now, six to eight years longer, that's quite a considerable amount of time. So what would Andrea and myself have to do to live as long as you, or to live up to the ripe old age of 100? Well, scientists have always tried to find the holy grail, a method to really increase how long uh, we get to live to. And it's really difficult to find a evidence-based method to do so. Most people might resort to um, pseudoscience and talk about the elixir of life, the fountain of youth, or the philosopher's mm. stones. At least they did so in the past. But what happens when scientists actually find a method that could work? Well, they would have to go to a remote mountainous zone where super longevity is common to both sexes. This island is located in Italy and it is Sardinia. And in this case, scientists have found that there are as many centenarians, uh, there are six times as many centenarians as on the Italian mainland, which is less than 200 miles away. And there are 10 times as many centenarians as there are in North America. In other words, it's the only place where men live as long as women. So, what does it take to live to 100 or beyond? What are they doing right? Scientists went to Sardinia and to two or three select islands and analysed the layout of the village. And what they saw was that it was tightly, um, and what, what they saw is that the houses were tightly um, spaced infrastructures and the whole city was made up of interwoven alleys and streets. That means that the villagers' live lives constantly intersect. Does that mean that you have to be a social butterfly and hop from one house to another and keep on talking 24-7 to live longer? In some cases, yes. Scientists went inside these homes and they saw a bustling household full of grandparents, mothers, fathers and children having a good old time around the kitchen table. But there's good news for people like me, who are a bit of a sourpuss and lone wolves and don't like any type of company whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Indeed, in some other households, there would be mostly men who do not like any company whatsoever, and they were normally around 100, 102. However, the main thing which really both households had in common was that plenty of people always dropped in. So that doesn't mean you have to be surrounded by company every single hour of the day. As long as you have people coming in and ensuring that you're okay, that's all that is needed. So once we see that company is really important, one starts thinking, well, is company the only thing that I need? I thought I had to eat up to five pieces of fruit and vegetable, exercise regularly and um, stop smoking or drinking. Considering all of these questions, the next question is, well, what can I do to know when I'm going to die and how can I put that day off? One researcher, uh, Julianne Holt Lundstadt, uh, who works at Brigham Young University, addressed this very question and she carried out a series of studies which comprised tens of thousands of middle-aged people. 
So she looked at every single aspect of their lifestyle, their diet, their exercise, their marital status, and how often they went to the doctor, whether they smoked or drank, and so on and so forth. She recorded all of this, and together with a team, she then sat back and waited for time to do what it does best, i.e. to pass. She went back after seven years and just checked who was still alive and who was already um, dead. Looking at all of the data that she collected, we can see that she managed to find specific indicators which reflected the likelihood of people living up to a certain age. Now, of course, hypertension is a traditional indicator. If you treat it, then the likelihood of living up until the age of 70 or 80 is quite high, but it's not as strong as many other indicators. Whether you're lean or overweight, that's also a very important factor and is part of traditional knowledge and common sense. You know, the more uh, you eat and mm, the more your body type leans towards the overweight uh, section, the less, uh, the more likely you are to die uh, at an earlier stage. However, this only ranks third. Exercise is also incredibly um, important, of course, mm. but it's still not as important as what I'm going to say now. Your close relationships are fundamental to your likelihood of living for longer. Now, what are close relationships? These are people that you can call if maybe you are short on money and need a loan, or who will call the doctor if you're not feeling really well, or will take you to the hospital, or will sit with you if you're going through an, existen an existential crisis, or if you're in despair. So these close relationships are a strong indicator of whether you will reach the age of 100 or more. But then there's something else which surprised me. Of course, family and friends are incredibly important, but even just talking to your neighbour or going to a cafe and thanking someone for preparing you a cup of coffee will actually indicate whether you live longer or not. So you have both weak and strong bonds. And the more you talk to people, regardless about the topic, the more you will live. And that uh, brings us to another very important factor. It looks as though social interactions really determine our quality of life. But a lot of people spend plenty of time online. Indeed, the lion's share of people around the world spend 11 hours a day interacting on social media, be it Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, you name it. Basically, all of our interactions are shifting from uh, our real world to an online world. So is there any difference between the interactions we have online and those we have face to face with other people? Apparently, uh, there is a huge um, difference because face to face contact releases a whole cascade of neurotransmitters and they act like a, um, like a tonic. They protect you now as well as in the future. Making eye contact with someone, even shaking hands, or giving somebody a high five is enough to release oxytocin, which increases your level of trust and it lowers your cortisol levels, meaning that it also lowers your stress. Now, we are really not conscious of all of this and we feel uh, the same type of happiness and fulfillment uh, when talking to someone face to face or whether receiving a like on social media. <clears throat> but Elizabeth Fredke has analysed that uh, when talking to two people, she would give them a speech um, and interact with them using her body language to try to elicit a specific response in their brains and then she would give the same speech to another person but the difference was that this second speech was recorded putting them in an mri machine she saw how specific parts of the brain that are associated with attention and social intelligence and social intelligence means anticipating what somebody else is thinking and feeling and planning your reaction based on their um, words um, change um, and are uh, much more engaged when we are interacting with a live partner. 
Now, this is why another um, professor, uh, a certain Nicholas Epley at the University of Chicago Business School, said that uh, interactions which are carried out face to face uh, will allow you to um, get your dream job because specific recruiters evaluating candidates perceive people who they interview in the same room as smarter. So your pitch, your job application may be written incredibly well, but if they don't hear you, they will not consider you um, to be a smart person. Now, as I said before, women live longer than men, but why is that? Well, unfortunately, as we are, you know, slipping into a bit of a minefield when it comes to stereotypes here, the one major reason is that women are more likely to prioritise their face-to-face -face relationships over their lifespans. Indeed, fresh evidence shows that these in-person friendships create a biological force field against disease and decline. And people haven't seen this only in women, but also in primates. So researchers have carried out tests with monkeys and have seen that female monkeys live longer than their male counterparts because of their closer, tight-knit uh, circle. The power of face-to-face -face contact is really why there is the lowest rate of dementia among people who are socially engaged, be they men or women. And so it acts better than any medicine that we could prescribe. As you can see, face-to-face -face interaction provides stunning benefits. Yet now almost a quarter of the population says they have no one to talk to. Building these interactions in our cities, in our workplaces and into our agendas bolsters the immune system and it sends feel-good hormones surging through the bloodstream and brain and thus helps us live stronger. So it is true that it may take a village to raise a child but looks as though the same can be said about achieving the incredible feat of blowing out 120 um, candles on your birthday cake. Thank you for listening.